Hello British Literature students. Welcome to the fourth week of the fall 2016 semester. It's a short week because we had uh, uh, Labor Day this week. So uh, this video will be coming at you starting on Tuesday rather than Monday. But if you're watching it, then you already know that. All right. So um, just a few quick things. Uh, I've graded all the week one postings. Uh, and I'm working on the week two postings. If I haven't gotten to yours yet, don't worry. It should happen soon. Uh, what I tried to do as I graded these postings is I tried to make sure to give you suggestions on how to get higher grades. In fact, I actually worded it that way in many cases. If you want to get higher grades on these postings, you need to X, whatever it was. Uh, the two most common uh, areas of problem, uh, one was people were not reading the directions. You know, I, I spell out my directions, what I want in these postings, and people were not including direct quotes, or people were not using specific details, or something like that. And the specific details is the second one. Uh, the words, for example, uh, can be very useful in these postings because it forces you to back up what you say with uh, some sort of evidence. So, um, read those comments that I've got on there for you. Uh, some of you, of course, uh, also lost points because of uh, bad grammar, bad spelling, things like that. Uh, tried to take these postings seriously. I know they go on a discussion board and they're not, you know, MLA format and they're not all that other stuff, but. Uh, they are still academic writings and uh, they should be treated as such. Alright, so this week you have Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, William Blake, and John Keats. Alright, this is quite a, uh, quite a uh, strange pairing, I guess, or strange group, if you will. But I couldn't really think of any better way to do it. Uh, we'll start with Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft is probably uh, one of the earliest feminist writers ever. So uh, she was actually arguing, and she's going to argue this, and it's a, it's a long passage I've got you reading. Uh, in some cases, that passage gets a little redundant. So you'll read something and say, wait, she said this already. But, you know, Greenblatt decided to include the whole passage anyway. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work uh, from Vindication of the Rights of Woman. And notice that woman is singular, not plural, because she's writing about the rights of womankind, not, you know, individual women. Uh, and her argument is that she wants women to receive the same type of education that men are receiving. And what she has found is that she has found that women are being educated to attract husbands. Not really to keep the husbands, not really to stimulate the husbands once they're married, but basically to be charming and act like silly little girls and to attract a husband their way. Um, and Mary Wollstonecraft says this is very problematic. Uh, she says that women should be educated the same way men are so that they can keep those husbands once they actually attract them. And they'll be better wives and they'll be better mothers for being much more intelligent. Because if a girl, is, if a woman is supposed to act like a little girl, at all times after she gets married, then how is she going to be a good mother to the children if she's acting as childish as they are? So, you know, look through my slideshow as you read this. It's very in-depth and will help you to understand this better as you do that posting. Then the other posting, you uh, don't necessarily have to include both Blake and uh, Keats, but you should include one of those. Uh, William Blake is hard to place because of the time he was born and the time he died and the time he wrote. So he's kind of on that cusp between the age of the reason or the enlightenment and the age of romanticism. Um, he wrote a, a pair of books that were designed for children and really William Blake was more of an artist than he was a poet. He, he did not think that his poetry would ever you know last as long as it has. What he wanted was to uh, write uh, children's books and illustrate them. And he illustrated them by hand. So there aren't very many copies of these books that William Blake illustrated by hand left. Most all of them are now in book collections or they're in museums somewhere on display. And the slideshow I have on William Blake actually shows uh, what these books looked like. Uh, the covers of the books and then of course uh, for the two poems I've chosen for you which this semester are The Tiger and the Lamb. But what he did with these two books, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, was he looked at innocence as a time before knowledge. Uh, when you're children and all you're relying on is where your next meal is coming from and mommy and daddy are taking care of you. And then Songs of Experience are after you've lived life for a little while and you've gained some worldly knowledge. Um, and he likes to look at two sides of the same coin. So I chose the lamb and the tiger 
Because both the lamb and the tiger, according to William Blake, who was an extremely religious man, by the way, um, they're both God's creations. The lamb is gentle, it's soft, you know, it, it makes them a ba sounds, you know, it eats grass, and so that's one of God's creations. But then God also created the ferocious tiger, which is a killing machine. Now, do tigers kill out of malice? No, kill, tigers kill to survive. They have to kill their prey in order to eat the prey in order to continue living. So the tiger is not an evil entity. And I, too many students want to call it that. It is not evil. It is what it is, which is a killing machine, which you know thins the herd and uh, probably ensures the survival of the elks and the lambs and such. And the question that's raised in this pair of poems is, how is it possible that a single God could create both the gentle lamb and the ferocious tiger? How do you uh, justify that? So that's something that uh, is explored in those two poems. Then we got John Keats. John Keats uh, accomplished a lot in the 25 years he was alive. He wrote a lot of poetry, and much of it was really good poetry. Um, I've included a, both a sonnet and an ode here. The sonnet is on seeing the Elgin Marbles. And look through the slideshow again. I've got pictures of the Elgin Marbles. The Elgin Marbles actually came off the face of the Parthenon in Greece. Uh, when England was invading all kinds of countries, one of the countries they invaded was Greece. And England thought, as spoils of war, they would take the Parthenon apart and pull the little facing off the front of it. Uh, and the guy that took them was a guy by the name of Elgin, hence the name Elgin Marbles. Um, and then put them on display in the British Museum. Greece now wants that piece of the Parthenon back, and they want their urns back. So you'll see Grecian urn is the uh, ode I've selected. Um, in fact, Greece really wants these treasures back, and Britain is saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're keeping these treasures for you because it's for your own good, because we know how to preserve them. So somewhere in Greece, there is actually a building designed to bring the Elgin Marbles back into, which uh, may or may not ever happen throughout history. So, um, that is a sonnet. Take, take note of what a sonnet is. And a Keatsian sonnet is different from a Shakespearean sonnet. So if you look, read Shakespeare's sonnets in English 1102, you'll see that the Keatsian sonnet is a little bit different in some ways. And what Keats would do sometimes is put one sonnet after another and create little chains of sonnets. Uh, he did not do that with the Elgin Marbles. This is just a 14-line poem. But he would do that with other poems. And then Ode on a Grecian Urn. Look at what an ode is. An ode is kind of like elevated poetry designed to take something ordinary and elevate it up to the status of uh, immortality or the status of greatness of some sort. So, like I said, there's all these Grecian urns on display in the British Museum. There's not one single urn that anybody can point to and say, ah, that's the one that Keats wrote about. But it's likely that Keats wrote about multiple urns and combined them into a single urn. Um, the artwork on these urns, even though they were designed basically to hold water or to hold urine or whatever, uh, the artwork was very elaborate. And so he was writing about that. Think about the theme of immortality. The two lovers that are about to kiss, they're right there, and yet they can't make contact. They will be frozen like that forever. Of course, the young lady will be beautiful for the rest of her life. The young man will be handsome for the rest of his life. And long after you and I are dead, that urn will still be sitting there, and those lovers will be just about to kiss, or that cow will be going to the slaughter. Or um, that, that a musician will be continuing to play that silent music uh, forever and ever and ever. There's an immortality in that, and yet it's an immortality frozen in time where there's no growth and there's no uh, living, actually. It's an immortality without living. So John Keats was obsessed with immortality as a theme. In fact, I think he touches on that a little bit in uh, Elgin Marbles as well. And it's ironic that he was so obsessed with it because he did die at such a young age. But his output was very prolific. So if you like these two poems, you'll probably love just about all of Keats' poems. All right, so that's it. That's this week's readings. Uh, those are things to think about as you do the postings. Definitely, 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 please, I'm begging you to read my comments on your first posting. So that you will know uh, what you need to do to get higher grades. Because I can grade a posting with a 9 or a 10 in no time. If a posting is a five or a six, now I've got to explain how I arrived at that. And uh, by the way, I would like to think you would like higher grades as well. So take my advice and you'll get them. Okay? That's all I have this week. Um, I hope you enjoy Keats and I hope you enjoy Wollstonecraft. And we will uh, talk to you again in the next video next week.